Good afternoon, evening, maybe even morning in parts of the world. Happy to be back. This is the Q&A session following lecture four. We're about halfway through. And one thing I really like about these Q&As is they point out to me things that, you know, I probably didn't explain in quite the detail that I should have earlier, or in many other cases, as some of these show, never even thought about. A number of the questions that came in this time deal with provisional patent applications. The first one you've got up here is how do I get a provisional patent? And the unfortunate answer to that one is that you can't because I don't think there's any such thing really anywhere in the world. In the US, we do have this provisional patent application. In a little more detail, what is it and why do we have it? It came about in, to some extent when we went to a 20 year term, people wanted a little extra time to think about things without cutting into the term, but still being able to get priority. We also wanted a way to give people some protection against disclosure abroad more than in the US because foreign countries typically did not have anything approaching a grace period. And frankly, rare exceptions or a few in some countries, but they're basically limited to such things as trade shows, don't today. So a provisional patent application was created to give a file something that is going to be hopefully closely related and disclose a significant part of what you eventually are going to want to try to file a patent application on but do it at a time that's early enough so you have a year before you finally have to put the final piece of paper together. If you do this, you have a priority document on file. That prevents you, let's suppose, typical provisional patent applications can range from full-fledged patent applications that you pay just as much for as you would have if you'd gone straight, or they can also be something you put together as the second question kind of talks about, the day before you put your paper live because you figured, oh my God, I'm about to lose all my rights in most of the world the minute I open my mouth and put this paper out. It gave you some protection against that. You can file a provisional application. It lasts for a year. At the end of a year, it dies in the patent office. And as a practical matter, unless you follow up on it, it's very doubtful anybody will ever look at it. It won't be available to be searched unless you follow up on it. It'll just lie there and eventually collect electronic dust. Once you have filed that in the US, you are protected insofar as you get a patent application or a patent apply for one on what it discloses from that paper provisional application being prior art. One thing you need to put together in your thinking about this is it's primarily a foreign application problem because as you probably recall from two or three months ago, we have a strange provision in the new patent law here that says your own disclosure or somebody who took your disclosure from you and makes it public in broader terms can't count against you for a year. A provisional application gives you the most protection in Europe where any, or Asia for that matter, where any publication killed you. There's no grace period, personal or otherwise. It also gives you protection against independent invention during the year, not from you, but during the year between your provisional application and what came later. Short answer to the question here is, are you then safe to publish your paper? The answer is yes. What you have to be careful about is to make sure that the provisional application and the paper are pretty much in sync with each other. Because if it's not in the provisional application, the details in your paper will not be protected. They will become prior art, and this can create some serious problems. So, publish your paper, but make sure your provisional is about as good as it can to be. 
you won't lose out on being able to get your paper out, but you have to be careful of how it fits and comports with what you're trying to invent or will try to patent and go later. Put your idea into practice, you need people with skills, and that obviously leaves me out. And it does create a dilemma, because how are you going to put together, frankly, either your paper or a good provisional patent application without other people's input and other people's help? This probably goes all the way back to lecture one. It's called a non-disclosure agreement. You want a really good non-disclosure agreement with everybody that you hire. You want to make sure that they are going to keep confidential any information they give you, any information you give them, and hopefully what they do for you. There's always a fairness issue that enters in here. How long does that obligation not to use, not to make public last? That's negotiable. People naturally don't want to file or sign a paper that says I can never disclose any of this. But you know that within a few years, in industry of industry, it's going to vary. What they are going to do for you will become public through marketing, through, frankly, your marketing, your advertising, the patents that are going to be published, papers you're going to publish. You need to protect against that. You probably don't need to protect yourself against everything that happens for the next 40 years. What do you want to do when you're going to file one? Do you want somebody to take a look at the prior art? The answer is probably yes. Unless you really know the prior art, you're going to have a very hard time deciding exactly what that provisional application and frankly your later patent, because remember you're thinking ahead of the provisional application, is going to cover. If you know the art well, you may not have to get a search. If you do get a search, remember it's not gonna find everything. There's just too much out there. The patent office won't find everything if and when they get to examining your second application, not the provisional. I would recommend normally that people do run a search. It probably has to be fairly tightly focused on really what you think the core of your idea is, or you're gonna get so much garbage back, you'll never be able to figure it out what really is or is not there. Can your patent be approved if there was prior art? Well, I assume here we're talking about your eventual patent that comes out of an eventual application. As I said a couple of minutes ago, a provisional application doesn't ever turn into a patent. It just kind of lies there and it gives you a stake in the ground against prior art when you finally get around to the regular application that the patent office is going to examine. Well, if there will always be prior art. The question is, is it prior art the type of thing that either discloses exactly what you're planning to do? We used the word anticipate earlier when we were talking about section 102 of the act, or does it in combination with what else is out there and what other people know make things obvious? And if it, what prior art shows that what you're doing isn't new, if the prior art shows that what you're doing is not obvious, either in the patent office or frankly in any later litigation, and beyond that, if you're in a serious negotiation with someone who is certainly going to look at prior art, if they're smart, to figure out how much it's worth paying you, your patent will rise or fall on how close and how good is that prior art. And you're never going to get a final answer on that, but you need to know enough about it. So when you're arguing with the patent office, you know what to focus on. And when you're arguing with other people down the line, hopefully you made the right decisions earlier up. What about claims? Current practice, I think of practically everybody, is not to put a claim in a provisional application. The patent office rules and regs tell you you don't need a claim. There's a little Philip that runs back here because the new act also talks about the claimed invention and some types of things that you need to have support in a prior application for the claimed invention. Well, if you don't have a claim, you don't have a claimed invention. 
So you're counting on the fact that provisionals really don't require one when you read the statute and the rules carefully. And I think that is correct, at least if you're going through a formal priority claim. There are some circumstances in which that may not be the case. Bottom line, have a conversation with your patent attorney, whoever he or she may be, on, and make sure that when you have this conversation, everybody knows enough about what it is you're going to claim, what procedures you're going to follow, frankly, where else in the world you are likely to go so you can make the right judgment on a claim. It's fair to ask, why don't people put claims in provisional applications? And there are probably at least two answers, maybe three. First, it costs more time and money to draft them, and you need a better application, a fuller one, before you're going to be able to write anything. Second, and probably the most important, or at least tied for it, is that the time of the provisional application, there are probably some questions that really need to be answered about what is important and precisely what should you claim. You will gain a lot of information, typically over the year after you file your provisional, that will get you much more focused on what your later application should look like and what it should claim, then you're going to have at the time you file a provisional, particularly if your provisional is nothing more than a cover sheet stapled on the paper that you're planning to present tomorrow. The last reason people often don't put in claims, and we'll get into this in somewhat more detail when we get to the next lecture, which is basically infringement, is there's a doctrine out there called the doctrine of equivalence, which means you may not be held exactly to the language of your claim if what somebody is doing is equivalent to exactly what you claimed. But there's a great big red flag. And the red flag is that if you added something to a claim for what the case is calling, you'll love this, a reason related to patentability, close quote you are barred from seeking equivalence on what it is you added. And if you have a very broad claim or a very different claim in a provisional, somebody sometime is going to argue, hopefully not successfully, that you narrowed your claims so that the claims you finally filed a year after your provisional, in fact, weren't nearly as broad as you hoped that they were going to be. Which brings you to the question, of how do you make sure your provisional isn't too limited? Again, take a step back. To be effective, a provisional is supposed to meet all of the requirements. And what do I mean by being effective? To actually give you that early date is your stake in the ground date, after which prior art doesn't matter. But to be effective, it's supposed to meet all the requirements of a real application with the exception of claims. It has to have a written description of the invention. It has to tell people to make and use. And as I think we talked about last time, it has to somehow provide support for whatever it is you're eventually going to claim. What do you do, for example, if you're trying your claim, your new patent, provisional application is on a rotating desk chair. And suppose you basically says, says it has a couple of ball bearings between the top half and the bottom half. That's what you plan to do. That's what this is described. What claim can you write if that's all you disclose? The only specific thing you could probably call out would be ball bearings. You could more generically, in most cases, talk about the top half being rotatable relative to the bottom, and you'll get away with that in most mechanical and electrical machinery types of cases. Some examiner will probably let you write a claim that says the two are rotatable relative to each other, or that there is a rotating system between the top and the bottom. So you'll have your support. But if you get a picky examiner or someone picky in a foreign country who tries to tie you to precisely what you disclosed, you have a more difficult situation. 
How do you handle it? Probably the way most people handle it is by putting in some wishy-washy language to say, there's a, a mechanism that provides for relative rotation. One is the shown here, a pair of ball bearings, but obviously there are lots of others that are now existing that you can use just to try to broaden it out. As I think I mentioned last time, the situation gets a little more difficult when you get into the chemical and bio field where the fact that you've disclosed one particular chemical or one particular molecule or one particular chemical biological procedure may not immediately make apparent to most of the rest of the world that hell, there are a lot of other things that do this too. There, you're gonna to have to be careful because a later claim that expands out, I think last time I used the basic halogens, fluorine, chlorine, if you, only, you found the fluorine worked and lo and behold, for some reason, chlorine doesn't, can you claim a halogen to pick up bromine? It is advisable to use general language there. You probably have to recognize you may have to cut it back at a later stage to what really is important, but it's an awful lot easier to sometimes cut things back than it is to add. How many provisionals do you have to file? I hadn't really thought of the first question. Could you file a provisional patent application with multiple inventions in it and use one as a priority date for a lot of later ones? But I did a little quick look in and thought about it, and frankly, I don't see why not. The thing you have to remember is if you have four different inventions in there, so you end up filing four different final applications, or the patent office requires you to split a big one into four, each of those four, the claims of each of those four, has to be supported by the provisional. So the more things you put together, the thicker your provisional is going to have to be, and the more potentials down the line, you're gonna to have to make sure you've covered so you can really claim them later. The much more usual procedure is for people to file series of provisionals in that one year period between the time the first is filed and when the third or that year runs out and you have to file a real one. Particularly in the biotech area, if you look at some of the bio patents, it's very clear people learned a lot in that one year period. And every time they learn something new, they filed a provisional. And then when the one year period approached, they then filed their final application and they claimed priority back to a whole string. And I've seen six or eight different provisionals using all of them for whatever dates they're worth to help support their claims to provide that stake in the sand in terms of prior art as you move ahead. That happens all the time. The multiple provisional for split into multiple patents later. I don't see why you can't do it, but I will admit I can't recall having seen it. Let's move from provisionals. Though actually really not that far. Because the first question is, will details in the US be enough for the rest of the world? The details in your provisional, you hope will, because you're trying to claim priority from that provisional in the rest of the world. And I think the normal answer to that is probably yes, unless you have intentionally cut something back. There are variations in different countries and I unfortunately can't sit here and tell you exactly what they all are, but there are company, countries where methods of treatment are not patentable, just as a type of subject matter. There are what are called Swiss claim to try to claim various drugs. You may have to think about what type of claim are you going to have to have in your Chinese or your Swiss or somewhere else in the world application and make sure you've got the details for that. But on the other hand, you may want to try pretty much the same type of claim in the US. So if you've put into the US everything that you need to support whatever type of claim you might want, and you'll recall that one of the slides we had up last time talked about bicycles and processes and improvements, et cetera, you can claim an invention in a lot of different ways. 
You can claim the how do you make it. You can sometimes claim the how do you use it. You can make, claim what it is. You can claim key parts. If you've put in enough details to be able to claim it as you want to anywhere else, you're probably all right going forward. Again, when you get down to your specific invention and specifically what you want to protect, talk to your patent attorney. And if you know countries where they're, you're really interested in them, push your attorney to make sure that he or she sends an email to their associate in India, China, Indonesia, Japan, et cetera, and Europe, to ask the question to make sure you're gonna be all right. There are a lot of minor differences through the world, and it's a lot easier to deal with them first than to try to explain your way past them if you tripped up in the beginning. So, continuing with details, do I have to disclose all of the details of my technology? Well, fortunately, the answer is no. Because a patent and a patent application, and I'm gonna use the US here as the example, is directed to a person of ordinary skill in the art who frankly knows some stuff, and if they know some of it, they can go look up others. You have to provide in your application enough detail so this person of ordinary skill in the art, posita, what a lovely word, can make and use your invention. You don't have to go into extraordinary details after that. The details, if you need them for a claim, if you're ever gonna to have to put a detail in a claim, I probably said it that four times already this morning, that detail has to be there because unless it's specifically mentioned in the application, or you can somehow use a generic quasi synonym, you can't put it into your claim. The more you disclose, obviously, the easier you make it for people who are watching what you're doing, who 18 months from your first filing are going to get on their computer and go see what your application actually looks like and decide whether or not to compete. There's not much you can do about that. Your application, your final one, will be published. It'll be published in the US and it will be published abroad. And the only exception to that is if you tell the US Patent Office, I'm never gonna file abroad, you can then request that they not publish, they won't publish, and your specification, the teachings of your patent application, won't become public unless or until the patent finally issues. But are you vulnerable to some extent? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. And the longer the time frame, the greater vulnerability. To some extent, you are worse off for a change. In the hard engineering world, than you are if you're playing with the FDA, because at least with the FDA, there's an approval process people have to go through, which will slow things down considerably. And we'll get into a little more detail on that, uh, I guess, in January. So if there is a risk while your patent is pending to other people making, using your invention. You have a potential for recovering a little, for some royalty from them after your patent final, finally issues, but that's limited, as I recall, and again, I'll, I'll recheck it before the next session, that's limited to the claims that were in the application that was published, and if you change the claims, you can't even collect that royalty, and you usually will change the claims. Is it better to obscure or play things down? Tricky question. Remember we talked about details a few minutes ago. We talked about halogens a few minutes ago. Maybe there's some quasi-organic halogens that I've never learned about. If you run long laundry lists of a lot of these various things, it's gonna be more difficult for someone to figure out what's really important. And obviously you have some in mind that are. You'll probably have support later but you'll make it more difficult for them. One of the things you run into here is the so-called best mode requirement. Where the US law, not foreign law, but US law requires you to disclose the best 
mode known to you at the time you file your application for making and using your invention. For some reason, I don't want to guess how many lobbyists were involved, the rule used to be that that held true not only in the patent office while you were seeking your patent, but it was a defense in litigation. The present law says it applies to the patent office, and will somebody pray tell me how in an examiner is likely to know what your best mode is, unless you put out a paper or something that tells him or her what it is. And it's no longer a problem in litigation, but it is a problem. When, one of the first jobs when I was still in law school, I was working in Polaroid's patent department, and Polaroid, you remember had all this gunk they put between what we used to call juxtaposed sheets, so in a minute or so you had a picture. They were extremely secretive and careful about what those chemicals were. The plants where they were made, my understanding is, they rolled them in in different colored 55 gallon drums. And they never told anybody what was in any of those drums. They were simply told to mix half a drum of this and a quarter of a drum of something else and so forth. That's great in real practice. How much of that do you have to disclose of what those chemicals are when you get to your patent application? What you have to disclose is enough so somebody at, at that stage, it was the best mode of practicing your invention. And here, the fact that the invention you're looking at is the claimed invention, which can be pretty specific, as opposed to the great big broad idea, is probably some help. But there is a tightrope. How obscure can you be without running afoul of other things? And frankly, the question here specifically talks about benefits, not the details. My view, and I think some other people will probably agree with me, and I know a fair number of people who don't agree with me, is I would talk about benefits. Don't you want the examiner to think your application is important? Remember, the first time you're gonna hear from an examiner is after she's read your application. You're not gonna have any contact until you get the first piece of paper back from the patent office from the examiner that substantively will practically never allow all of your claims, may or may not be focused on the right thing. You want the examiner to come away from reading your application with a, hey, this is a big deal. This is what this poor person has done. You know, really, uh, it looks great to me and I don't find anything that talks about it. The more obscure your application is, the broader their sweep is going to be of search, and the easier it's going to be for an examiner to say, what in heaven's name is all this about? But again, it's a balance. Because if the benefits change, you have to change your tune as things go forward. Suppose the thing you said was the greatest thing since apple pie, and you find out that nobody likes apple pie. So now you're back at lemon meringue or blueberry. If you put it all in your application that apple pie is what's important, you've created a downstream problem. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer, but that's basically the way it is at the moment. It's a lot of this is a balancing act. It's a balancing act, it's a legal act, and it's frankly a psychology of dealing with the people you're gonna deal with. The, the patent examiner, potential licensee, or a court. If somebody thinks you've really got something, you're in better shape. But if they think you didn't have the foggiest notion of what you were doing, you're not in good shape. Finally, last question, you've got a patent. Heaven be praised. Now what do you have to do? One question that always comes up is do I have to use it? Do I have to practice my invention? Do I have to license it? US to begin with, you neither have to use nor license. In the law in the, this country for well over 100 years. Abroad, the situation is a little different. There are a lot of companies, countries, not companies, that have compulsory license requirements that require you to license your invention 
sometimes within four years after you filed your applications, an alternative may be within three years after the patent issued, and you have to grant a license. On exactly what terms, et cetera, is a little unclear, but the provisions are out there. It's not clear as a practical matter how often those come into play. Why don't they? Well, the best reason I saw and thought of flipping through things is if you have an invention that's important enough so somebody wants to license it, the odds are that you or some licensee of yours is already doing it. It's much less likely that someone will want to license a piece of, pat of a patent that you frankly had utterly no interest in or that you thought was junk. A couple of countries, European, Spain, and Turkey, not only require compulsory licensing, they require that you actually, quote, work. In other words, use the patent. Either you, and let me be clear, it's you or your own licensees. You don't have to do it personally. You, you, if you're doing it through people you deal with, that counts as using your patent. Again, no real downsides, very often at least in the real world, but the requirements are out there. And if you have something that is of commercial interest and you're sitting on it, at least in some parts of the world, you may be required to move over. This next set of questions deal with a couple of things. Now we're really going back to the beginning. They deal with copyrights and they deal with agreements that you reach with people or you should reach with people to whom you have to disclose things. How do I manage a copyright? Well, let's start off at the basic. By manage means, how do I get a copyright? I get a copyright simply by writing it down, by filming it, by typing it into my computer. U.S., anything, any notes you may happen to be taking today under U.S. law are copyrighted the minute they are, quote, fixed in a form from which they can be perceived by man or machine. Most of the world has rather loose also requirements. You don't have to do much of anything to get a copyright. You don't have to use a copyright notice. You don't even have to register a copyright. In the US, you have to register before you can sue, but registration is a pretty much a purely US creation. You don't have to register it elsewhere. They're rarely examined to speak of. So how do you manage the copyright for a creative medium, such as a video game or film? You assume you've got it copyrighted, you probably put a copyright notice on it to at least warn people. This is much more important for things that are much more mundane than video games or films, just basic stuff you see all over the internet. There's a tendency on pe right, people who so it's up on the internet, it's not copyrighted, of course I can copy it. Put a copyright notice on it. It's not necessary, but at least it warns people that you take this somewhat seriously. A video game, what do you want to copyright? You have to ask that question on everything. Video game, there are really probably two aspects. First off is a lot of computer code, because that's what's making that game come up in the beginning. And you can copyright computer code. Probably also you have a lot of images that you want to copyright. When you get to a film, you have the images, you probably have a background soundtrack, you simply probably have a script. All of these are potentially subject to copyright. You can record these copyrights with the US Copyright Office in this country. They have forms online. They'll pretty much tell you which ones to use. And if you have any questions, give them a call and ask. My experience has been they're fairly cooperative working this through with you. They figure their job is to help you, not to stand in your way. The next four questions here really come down to how do I protect myself against people who one way or another know about my idea, my documents, my data, my invention. What comes down to the top of the list? It's called agreements. Internet providers and tele 
comm providers from stealing my files. Well, if you're talking about them simply hacking you and stealing your files, and it's maybe what this is, that's beyond my realm of doing. And there are a lot of people who are a lot better at hacking than I am. Obviously, that's just that secure computer business, something I don't do as good a job of my own as I could. If you're talking about people to whom you may have given data or information, and that really runs into the next Google question, what's your agreement with them? Do you have a written agreement? Do you have, as you probably do when you clicked into Google or a lot of other things, a very small print, accept our terms and conditions, and if you're like me, you accept because you're not about to spend the time reading and trying to figure out what all those are about. But it all comes down to what is the agreement? You're back in trade secret country. You're back in limitations on use on things that I've disclosed to you. Google will tell you it doesn't sell your search data. If you look at a search, what are the basic components? Well, you put in what you wanted to look at. Google then went into its files and gave you back the things it thought corresponded to that. Well, obviously everything that was in his files in the beginning is just still there and anybody else can find it for any other reason. The ties that that, which particular pieces of prior art are tied to your idea? Well, Google says they won't sell your data, but they will say that they can use it, as I understand, to help improve their overall business and understanding. They are not the world's most transparent enterprise. A lot of trust has to go into this. I've never heard of Google selling my, somebody's search idea, but I'm not about to sit here and tell you that it's never happened because I frankly don't know. Copyright mark on a document. Well, as I said a couple of minutes ago, that document of yours is copyrighted, whether or not has a copyright notice on it. But a copyright notice does help you tell people that, hey, I'm serious, this is copyrighted. And if somebody wants to get a copy of your document and then goes ahead and exploits it, well, if you put that document out into the public domain where anybody can at least read it, even if it's protected by copyright, what are your potential means of recovery? Frankly, you've probably got to sue somebody for copyright infringement, for damages you'll never be able to prove. It's not easy. An agreement, Best answer keeps coming back to something I hope I said in the first session. The best way to protect information is don't tell anybody. And if you have to tell somebody, make sure it's a group with whom you're closely related and they understand what's important. Don't try to protect everything because everything ends up being nothing. But there are jewels that are out there that you do want to protect. I am told that a lot of companies frankly, have given up on protecting anything except the real crown jewels in their trade secret realms. They figure it just can't be done in this society today, given how much stuff is out there and how mobile people are. And that kind of leads to the, how you can get your data from being transmitted or resold. Who'd you give it to? Once they've got it, how are you going to control what they could do? I can't tell you. If they've specifically agreed not to and somebody understands it and they have a procedure the person to whom you gave it, for telling people, hey, this is something we cannot retransmit. You're in much better shape than if you simply handed it over to them and say, okay, guys, I really want you to keep this confidential. What do YouTube and Saturday Night Live do with all of their stuff? My guess, and I don't really know completely on this, is that all these Saturday Night Live skits are automatically copyrighted when they're recorded because they're now fixed in the medium. My, they are automatically copyrighted. What I don't know is what time frame they follow. Do they try to register that copyright, frankly, at all? And if so, do they register it before or after it goes live? remembering that you don't have to register to have the copyright. You only have to register if you want to sue on it. And you ha can't collect what's called statutory damages 
if you haven't registered. So their impetus is to register very early. I don't know what their practice is. My guess is that these are big enough deals that they probably are registered. Registration is not a complicated procedure, but where it does in the timing, like most of us, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that Saturday Night Live skit is nowhere finished until people actually have said it because exactly what's going to happen always produces surprises. I'd guess that they register it soon after, but again, I'm simply not sure. Creative Commons copyright. My initial question is, what are they? So I did some looking around. And they're an organization whose goal is to provide standard licenses that you can use so that other people can make use of your copyrighted materials. That they can publish them, they can exploit them, in some circumstances they can use them commercially. They have, if my count, an overriding, you just agree with them that this is absolutely free, it's a public domain, do what you will with it, the owner of the copyright doesn't care. Beyond that, they have six different types of licenses. All of them require attribution. They vary in terms of, can they simply put out what you have? Can they modify it, make derivative works, put it together with their own stuff? Can they use it for commercial purposes? You can choose any one of these six licenses and it's pretty much your choice. It wasn't readily apparent to me that you ever got any money back to speak of from any of these licenses. There've been some criticisms of the Creative Commons that it just isn't sufficiently precise and people don't exactly know what they're gonna do. But I saw numbers that said there are millions of licenses out there that are currently in use. So if people are using it to spread what they want to do, which is they want to spread what they call creativity. If that's your goal, if you're interested not in copyright, but in co what people can call a copy light, which is making your information available, they are a mechanism to make what you want people to know about and to be able to do, because you're looking, frankly, for something beyond your own pocketbook. They're a good mechanism for doing it. When you come up with something, you're gonna to have to read six different form licenses and figure out which one you're interested in. Okay, a couple of, uh, this is sort of the other category. Some people will litigate IP infringement on a contingency basis. They won't do it unless they think you've got a real good case because otherwise, obviously, there's not much return. The person who has agreed to litigate this for you is clearly going to put time in it. They clearly, or somebody's going to have to have some significant out-of-pocket costs. They're going to have to be covered. No law firm is going to do this unless they think there's a real chance of getting recompensed for it. There are several different, two principal different mechanisms by what this is done. One would be you simply hire a firm on a contingency basis. The agreement with them would provide how the percentage of any recovery is split. It's nearly always a split after all expenses. There may be something in there on who actually has to pay all the expenses. One of the reasons you want somebody to take it on a contingent basis is you don't want to have to pay. Well, typically a contingent fee agreement, they don't have to pay for the lawyer time, but who will pay actual expenses? Cost of depositions, for example, is up for negotiation. Who pays? You hire a litigator. The other way it happens is that a law firm or the like will simply buy your patent. And then they will take complete charge of how they want to try to enforce it. Again, they won't buy it unless they think there's something in it for somebody. That has a perhaps disadvantage for you in that you've really lost much, pretty much all control over who do they sue and for what. And they may think there's a lot more money out of suing people that have nothing to do with your business than people 
who are in your business, there's a benefit that if you don't own the patent, you've got some level of protection against being harassed through all the discovery process because, hey, says the person who owns a patent, I don't know, go get them, but they have to go out and run a side route, the formal route, as opposed to simply asking as part of the litigation. It works, if you've got a good case, it may settle. I'll, most of these will, if it's, somebody, if it's a good case, let's frankly, if somebody's serious about suing me, and I know they've got a good case, I'm much better off settling for at least two reasons. First, it is probably gonna be cheaper. And second, you, you saw some of the cost figures on litigation a few months ago, they're, they're terrifying. Second, settlement is secure. No lawsuit has a sure outcome. If you've drafted a decent settlement agreement, you both know what you can do and can't do, and the element of the coin flip of litigation is gone. IP insurance. There's a lot of talk about it, and it's certainly out there. There seem to be, I will tell you, start at the top, I've never used it, and I don't, don't recall ever talking to a client who has used it, because one of the things is clearly that it's not cheap. And the other is that it is clearly subject to a lot of prerequisites and conditions that the person granting the insurance policy has to be certain of how good your patent, what's the market look like, et cetera, before they're gonna sell you the insurance. But if you're after the insurance, there seem to be at least four different types. One is if you're being sued for infringing a patent, will they pay the cost of defense and any damages? What you'd like is, of course, they'll pay all the cost of defense and they'll pay any damages. I would expect the policy you'd actually get would probably have some limits in it. Second, suppose you're the person bringing the lawsuit, it's your patent. There are policies that you can buy that will basically give you something akin to recovery as you work down that path. There's also insurance that will help you collateralize your IP if you're after a loan. And then there's an entire category, these first three are really pretty much patent, so the second, the collateralization can fall over into other categories. There is insurance available for people who have, mainly inadvertently, but certainly have used somebody else's trade secret. I mentioned a couple of months ago that one of your real risks when you're putting together a product or hiring people is making sure that you and your employees don't use what somebody else thinks is their trade secret. Foreign filing licenses is what the third one's about, Department of Defense clearance. When you file a patent application, you have to wait for six months before you can file anything abroad. If you hear from the patent office in six months, they will probably, they may tell you that you can't file abroad, this is subject to a secrecy order, we aren't even gonna examine it, we're gonna put it in the vault. Doesn't happen very often, certainly doesn't happen in most technologies. Couple of things you need to be aware of is you probably also have read about or know about the export control regulations, export of, of security information, to say nothing of the trafficking in arms regulations that are even more onerous. Neither of those is the same as a patent filing license. A patent filing license simply means you can file your patent application in another country. It doesn't mean that you can publish any of that information in another country until such time as it's become public. Once your application has been published, then any of the information in it is public, so you can get it. It's no longer the type of thing that's protected by the regs. But the export control regs and the arms control regs are a pain in the neck to work through. They're separated out by different types of things, by different countries, and they're very different from simply getting the license you need to file your patent application kind of all over the world. Punishment for IP defaulters. 
criminal, send him to jail, lock her up. There's not much locking up going on. There is copyright infringement can be criminal. There is criminal copyright infringement. On the trademark side, there's trademark counterfeiting, counterfeiting that is criminal. There's label as products. There's also label counterfeiting. Trade secrets there are both state and federal laws that deal with criminalization of those acts. Your difficulty is you've got to convince some U.S. attorney or some district attorney to bring the case. And that's not going to be easy to do unless it is really egregious. Justice Department doesn't have the manpower or frankly the interest in bringing a criminal complaint against anybody who violates the copyright in a document that you gave them. In most cases, the penalty is only a fine. There are some jail terms involved if things are really bad, particularly in the trademark counterfeiting area. But as a rule, it's a fine, often not a very big one, and it's not easy to get anybody to bring a criminal case anyway. Is it true that works in the public domain, if modified, can become an original work, et cetera? Let's separate some things out here. First off, if something's in the public domain, you can copy and sell it commercially, period. You don't have to change anything. It's no longer subject to protection. Public domain, if really public domain, means exactly that. In the copyright field, it can make a long time for something to get there. Disney keeps extending the period of time until Mickey is going to be public domain. So you're talking, in many cases, better part of 100 years. If modified up to 20%, I'm not sure where the 20% came from. I did a little quick looking and didn't come up with anything. If whoever submitted this question could tell me, I'd really like to know. The basic underlying question is, if you've got something that's in the public domain, as opposed to subject to copyright, if it's in the public domain, what does it take for it to become sufficiently original so that you can claim copyright in the changed one? And the answer is not much. I guess is considerably less than 20% of the overall. Really minor modifications make something, quote, original. It just means original so it doesn't mean it's obvious. It simply means it's something that you originally did. It doesn't take much to turn an old work into a modified work. On the other hand, and I think I talked about this earlier, if something is still subject to copyright, you've got serious problems selling your modified work no matter how modified, unless you can somehow qualify for one of the fair use exceptions. And if you're infringing, you can't register it yourself. There were a couple of questions at the tail end dealing with licensing. Licensing is just far too big a subject to try to get into in this type of session. We'll talk a lot about licensing as part of how do you exploit your invention in the sixth one of these lectures, both in terms of partnering types of things, what types of licenses, government licenses, why would you want one, when might you get one, what are the typical types of terms. And in the final session, we, I hope to have and expect to have someone from MIT TLO, office, Technology Licensing Office here, who can talk to you and tell you a lot of how things get special when you're dealing with a university like MIT, like Stanford, and frankly, like a lot of other universities. If you can't wait that long for your sample agreement, log on to the MIT Technology Licensing Office. They've got some sample agreements up there. Take a look, they'll give you an idea of the type of thing that's there. For more details, we're gonna to have to wait till next year. So let me ask Andrew, we're now got, to me, we got six minutes left, what's come in? <laughs> so, um, okay, so coming back to the last slide, if we can go back one slide. Yep. So I think the uh, issue of the public domain work, it's, it's a question of um, what is transformative? <sighs> 
The easy transformative tends to be such things as parity. Easy transformative might be a cartoon that it was there originally to promote Johnson's talc. And they got one out there that let's say it promotes the asbestos and talc as a warning to the public. That would probably be considered transformative. Unfortunately, a lot of this, it's what did the judge eat for breakfast? Did it agree with their stomach or not? Because there's an awful lot of judgment calling on what's transformative. The other thing I can say about transformative is when I got started in this business, that category didn't really exist. It, keep, it grew, has grown over the last 50 years, and more and more things have been found to be transformative. Okay, so going back all the way to the front, we discussed how prior art, art can put a stake in the ground yep. for your full patent application. Flipping it around, could prior art hurt or hinder your patent application? Sure. Prior art can mean what you're trying to claim simply is not patentable. It's not, it's previous, the invention has previously been disclosed in a patent, a published application. It's been made or used anywhere in the world. If somebody finds that, you can't patent it anymore. What you've done isn't new. And I think we talked about, I probably used the example of the invent, the person sitting in a room with all the prior art hanging on the walls. If that person comes up with an idea and uses that prior art, he's got an argument, she's got an argument that everything they did was obvious. And if that person happens to be you, or tried to patent it, it's obvious too. And again, it's not patentable. You have to get beyond prior art to have a valid patent. And prior art is a term that unfortunately is thrown around. It's usually used by people who are talking about it in the sense of something that is important or critical to my patent. I like to put it into two buckets. First off, prior art is anything that happened before, as a practical matter, you filed your patent application. Then you have to put it through the sieves to find out, is any of this prior art for the same thing that I'm now trying to patent? Or does this prior art really make it obvious? Are you simply putting together old things that do what they always did together? Do they give you a reason for doing what you want to do? All the things we talked about when we talked about KSR and obviousness. Prior art is critical to what you can get a patent. Um, so you talked a little bit about the, you finally obtained a patent. Yep. And uh, in the U.S. has no licensing or use criteria, but does, is that an issue when you need to file for a claim? I think the answer to that question is no. You can claim, a lot of people, patent applications, patents, the vast majority of patents probably have utterly no commercial value and are never used. All that matters to the patent office is are you claiming something that is new and not obvious? And did you file a patent application that is sufficient to tell people what the invention, what you think your invention is, how to make and use it, et cetera? The patent office does not care who uses or doesn't use your claimed invention once that patent issued. And then you went on to talk about the copyright notice tells everybody in the world that you're serious. Similarly, we see patent pending use on products and services. Yep. Is Why? This, <laughs> is that just purely a marketing tag? Or, you know, is there some sort of... Um, criteria okay. that you have to have in order to put something like that on? All you need to have is a pending application that covers the product. And it may be a, a claim, doesn't have to be an allowed claim. It can be a claim that nobody in their right mind would ever grant. 
But as long as it's there, you've got a pending application that's trying to claim this. Why do you do it? Well, you know, as you just said it, half of it. Half of it is, well, the second half is when the patent issues, the advertisement goes out, so novel and great it's patented. <laughs> patent pending, it's so novel and great that we're actually looking for a patent on it. All marketing. Another reason is slightly protective and perhaps helpful to you. But if you've got a product out there and you put patent pending on it, and I decide that's not a pretty neat product. I think I'm going to copy it and get in the business. I've been warned. I've been warned that this thing may shortly end up being patented. And do I really want to put time, effort, technical development and marketing effort into something that's going to be a problem in say two, three, five years. If you've got a patent, if I'm looking at your product and asking myself, whether I should copy it or compete, and I see patent pending. I'm gonna go online and I'm gonna to try to find your patent applications. And I'm gonna to try to find out what it is that you're trying to claim. And if I think you've got a decent chance of getting that claim, if I can't design around it, I'll put my money somewhere else. Right, final question. The issue of copyright registration. Yep. <clears throat> you said that Registration is primarily for um, to file claim. Um, so, if you found infringement in copyright, do you can you register to sue afterwards? If you find infringement, you can then register and you can then sue. There is a question now, and courts are trying to answer that is pretty low level actually. It's when is the registration effective? Is it the day the Copyright Office gets it or the day they finally put a stamp on it? But you can certainly register after infringement has started. You are more limited in some of your recovery if you haven't registered until then, but you can certainly stop things going forward. Okay, well, that's uh, all the time we have for our questions today. Oh, two minutes after the hour. <laughs> Thank you for your time again, and we'll see you soon. See you next year. Thank you, everybody.